About 300 years ago, there was an English skeptic who was um, a part of what was called then the free thinker movement. Um, Anthony Collins was his name. Um, he, he, was, uh, he would not uh, call himself an atheist or an agnostic, he, but certainly no one would confuse him with a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, we might call him today a skeptic. Uh, he, was, he questioned just about everything except his own thinking. Uh, free thinker. He wrote a treatise called Discourses on Free Thinking, which was widely published and, and became kind of a hit during that time. Uh, one day he was walking uh, out on a Sunday morning and he came across uh, an older man who was uneducated and a and working man, uh, poor. And uh, just to sort of be honorary, he went up to the fellow and he said, where are you going? And uh, the man said, well, I'm going to church. And Collins asked him, well, tell me, is your God a great God or is he a little God? And his intent in that question was to try to confuse the obviously poor, uneducated man. And the man replied with a perfect answer. He said, my God is great enough that, that the heavens cannot contain him. And yet he is small enough that he can dwell in someone as small as me. Years later, uh, Anthony Collins admitted that that answer uh, shook him. He had read a whole bunch of uh, treatises on religion uh, from professional theologians, and nothing struck him as poignantly as that simple statement from this uneducated man about the presence of God. Uh, we're doing a message today called The Omni Omnipresence of God, and it just means God is fully everywhere. He is everywhere, but even there, when he is somewhere, everywhere, he is fully there. Uh, oftentimes, uh, probably once a month, I find I have double scheduled myself. Uh, on occasion, I have triple scheduled myself, and I find it very difficult to, to be in three different places at the same time. Uh, God doesn't have that problem. I find it difficult to try to talk to three different people at the same time, uh, three different conversations. God doesn't have that problem. He is fully everywhere at the same time. Uh, Jeremiah says, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? And as it relates to the uneducated poor man that uh, talked to Collins, uh, if I could put words or scripture to what the man was saying to him about the greatness of God, Isaiah 66, 1 uh, is, is a great verse here. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Think about that image. Heaven, that's as big a concept as we can understand, is my throne. And the earth, if we were out in space looking at the earth, is my footstool. Is an image, something about the greatness of God. Heaven is my throne, the earth is, is my footstool. What is the house which you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? And yet, God is small enough to dwell inside of his people. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Now, when I think about the presence of God or the, the omnipresence of God, uh, it's easy for me and for, I think for most of us as Christians to go, yep, I believe in the presence of God and I'm, I'm thankful for his presence, but then to sort of dismiss it over off to the side is not really that important. And, I, and I, when I think about that, I wonder why. And there are three things that struck me about that. One, we are fixated on something other than God to meet our deepest needs. It might be fixated on getting married. It might be fixated on a husband or your wife or your children or a job or a career. But there's something else that grabs our attention that we naturally just sort of assume is more important than the presence of God in our life. Fixated. A second reason why we don't, uh, it appears to me, that we don't value the presence of God more is that when we think about God, we really don't think about his presence. What we think about is God fixing something. Why can't he fix my broken marriage or my broken kids or my, or my parents? Uh, why can't he do something about my boss or my work or my, my finances? We're looking to God to fix something more so than to be a part of his presence and have him walk with us. 
uh, fixated or fixed. The third reason, I think, is feelings. Uh, genuine Christians really desire to experience the presence of God, or we say to feel close to God. And where that does happen some, it, it appears to me uh, in an unscientific survey that the longer that you are a Christian, the less it seems that God, that God favors us with really enjoying his presence uh, and feeling his, close to his presence. Uh, in some ways, I think he maybe is trying to wean us off of our feelings and more to the fact of his presence. Regardless of how our life is going, that the fact of his presence is what can anchor us. Uh, when you think about the presence of God, I think about two prepositions. In the Old Testament, the preposition is the preposition with. God is with his people. And I love the illustration of Moses. Try to, imagine, try to put yourself in Moses' shoes. God tells him out in the desert, I want you to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler in the world. And I want you to confront him and tell him to let my people go out of slavery who have been there for 400 years. Imagine what, what could happen there. And he, he probably thought he's going to be killed, executed. And yet he goes and through a series of 10 particular plagues, uh, finally Pharaoh relents and the people of God uh, are, are released from Egypt and they head out across the, the dry bed of the Red Sea onto the other side. And a, a, what should have been an 11-day excursion to the promised land turned into a 40-year excursion. Now, imagine if you were tasked with having to feed 2 million people every day out in the desert or the wasteland. Now, for many years, I was tasked with feeding five people, including myself. <laughs> imagine trying to find water in the desert for 2 million people and for all the flocks and herds that were there. Imagine the enemies that were around them, of which we're familiar in the Old Testament, and, and, and your people have nothing, no swords, no spears. And if those things weren't hard enough, I think the most difficult thing for Moses was that the people he was, he was supposed to lead drove him crazy. <laughs> These people were excellent at murmuring and grumbling and complaining. They complained about the food. They thought that the food was so bad, we would rather go back to Egypt where we had leeks and onions. Back into slavery. They rebelled against his authority. Some of them tried to push themselves forward as the leader. And the people were not just mad at him, but they just could not get along with each other. Every day from sunup until sundown, there was a line of people waiting to present their case in court for Moses to declare who was going to be right and who was going to, to win a judgment. And finally, his father-in-law said, this is crazy. You need a whole bunch of more judges to do this. I think Moses came to the place where he was at the end of his rope. And he has a great prayer that I love. It's in Exodus 33, 13. He says, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Now, what is he praying there? I think he's praying something like this. If he was a quarterback on a, uh, a top-notch team in college football, and every play that he was running was not going well, and the team was losing, I think he would, he would appeal to the offensive coordinator and say, you know what, whatever plays you're calling up there, I think I need to get in line with what you're calling and not just call the plays that I want to play. Because I think if I do that, maybe it will go better for us on the field. So, so show me your playbook. I'm not going to run my playbook anymore. That's something of what he was saying. And then he sort of puts a little guilt trip on God about this. He says, and consider that this nation is your people, and they're not my people. <laughs> no, no, look at me. They're your folks. You, got, you better do something with them. Now, if you were God and you heard that prayer, Moses at the end of his rope, what would you, how would you think that that prayer would be answered? I would think that what I'd be looking for is, is, is a different kind of food instead of manna so that people wouldn't complain so much. Or maybe you could open up a large lake and we can just camp here for a while and there'll be plenty of water and maybe acres and acres of pasture land for all the, 
all the uh, crops, I mean, all the, peop- all the uh, animals that we have. And maybe you would provide some, um, uh, an ally that's strong and can protect us. And yet, God didn't answer the prayer in any of those things. He answered the prayer that I think Moses at first would probably be disappointed in, and probably you and me too. This is how God answers this prayer. When Moses is at the end of his rope, God says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. That is a stunning answer to a prayer to somebody at the end of their rope. My presence will go with you. And the connection is that somehow, Moses, in the middle of all the chaos in which you find yourself and all the head scratching that you find yourself doing and the people that are just driving you nuts, my presence is enough to give you rest in the midst of all of that. And I think, really? Is that possible? If we valued the presence of God, not the feelings of his presence, but the fact of his presence in such a way, could that become an anchor in my life that no matter what I face, when a difficulty or, or ang- things that anger me or discourage me or depress me, that somehow I could still find rest and peace. Now, the second, that's the preposition with. God is with us. In the New Testament, Mostly, the writers use a different preposition, that God is in his people. He comes to live inside of us. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm not calling the shots anymore. He is. Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's in me. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? The Holy Spirit has come to live within you, which you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. God is with his people, and he comes to live within us. Now, when I think about, uh, as we're moving towards, well, what does this mean in my everyday life? I want to give you two examples from the Psalms. Uh, the first is, is from David. King David is first known on the scene when he uh, overcomes Goliath and beats him with five smooth stones. He uh, becomes a national hero. Uh, the prophet Samuel comes and anoints him king. And you would think, if you were David, that the next thing would be to go to Jerusalem and be, an, and be crowned the king. But Sa- uh, King Saul's the king, and he is extremely insecure. And uh, he starts the process of trying to assassinate David, young David. David flees for his life. David flees to the mountains for his life. He flees to the coast for his life. He flees to the hills. He lives in caves. He's afraid during the day, and he's afraid of ambush at night. There are times when he has several hundred men who are with him and trying to support him, but Saul has an army of about 3,000 who is chasing him over and over and over again. I can't imagine living with that kind, of, that kind of daily threat upon your life. And you always need to be on the alert and be ready to flee. Now, finally, Saul is killed in battle. David becomes king. Um, and uh, after the Bathsheba incident, which was a meltdown for David, he comes back to his throne and his son Absalom usurps the throne. And David, once again, is having to flee for his life. Uh, Later on, David looks back on his life, and he writes one of, for a lot of Christians, one of their favorite psalms, Psalm 139. Um, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down and when I rise up, thou searches out my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, Lord, you know us all together. You just beset me behind and before and layest your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. And then we come to the passage, the next six verses that I want to highlight for this particular message. He reflects back on his life, and he asks a series of rhetorical questions that he already knows the answer to. Whither shall I go from your presence? Whither shall I flee from your spirit? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol or hell, 
thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other most parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. Night is bright as the day. Darkness is as light with thee. Whether the darkness happened to be at night and the fear of an ambush or whether the darkness was what we call the dark night of the soul or depression, the one thing that David had learned through all of those years was that God is with him. And because God was with him, no matter how life looked, he was anchored in the fact of God's presence. Psalm 46 is another psalm that's just a, a delightful psalm to read. The uh, theme of the psalm is in the first verse, it's in the last verse, and it's tucked in two other times. And in between each of these little themes, is the psalmist describes the worst possible calamities that we could experience. And he just kind of goes back and forth between the theme and calamity, theme and calamity, theme and calamity, and finishes with the theme. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And then he goes to calamity. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. He's speaking metaphorically about the worst kind of catastrophes that can happen to us. And then he goes to the theme. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He's stating a fact of which can anchor us. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. He thinks about, I made it through today, and he'll be here in the morning. Back to the calamity. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Back to the theme. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our stronghold. Back to the calamities. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. And then he finishes with the theme. Cease striving, or commonly, uh, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The theme he finishes with. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The presence of God is equated with God's strength to endure the worst of calamities. And now I'd like to close with several different ways that, that uh, in my life where the, the presence of God has made a difference in some of the calamities in my life. Uh, the first, uh, and this is on page three in your handout. When I am abandoned, or it seems like I'm abandoned, God is my strength. I love Paul in writing in 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy 4. He's been in prison. Um, he, he knows he's going to be executed. It's just a matter of time. And he writes to Timothy his last letter, chapter 4, verse 16. At my first defense there in Rome, when he went to court, no one came to my support. It's an astounding statement. This amazing hero of the faith, when he had to go to court, none of his buds were there. Everyone deserted me. And here's a more astounding statement. May it not be held against them. May it not be held against them. But the Lord, why? But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, presence of God, my stronghold, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, not so I can feel better about my time here in prison and as I face death, but so I can still be about the task with which I am engaged in trying to help people find Jesus and grow in him. My strength. When I am discontented, God is my contentment. When I am discontented, God is my contentment. Hebrews 13, 5. 
Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you nor forsake you. If you're on the road where you assume that possessions and money is going to be uh, what brings you content, you are going to be driving for a very, 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 very long time. The scriptures tell us that destination never comes. When I am overwhelmed, third, God is my sustainer. When I'm overwhelmed, God is my sustainer. One of our songs we sang this morning pulled from this verse. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Here again, God is speaking metaphorically about those situations that come into your life that just seem like they're just going to sweep you away. Overwhelmed. Number four, when I'm brokenhearted, God is my comforter. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Oftentimes when people are, are brokenhearted, they say, where is God? Well, the answer is he's right next to you. It may not feel that way. It may not seem that way, but the fact is true. When I'm doubting, God is my assurance. There are times in our life as Christians where we just think, I keep making the same old mistakes and I keep doing the same sins and I just don't seem to be making that much progress. Welcome to the club. And it's easy at those points to say, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. Maybe I really never became a Christian. It's easy to feel that way at times. Jesus said in John 10, 28, I gave them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Ultimately, it really doesn't matter how I feel about my spiritual progress or lack of progress. What matters is he's got a hold of me. And that can anchor me. On the back side of your hand, when I am fearful, God is my helper. When I'm fearful, God is my helper. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Are you kidding me? I've got a stuttering problem. You got the wrong guy. And God said, I will be with you. This will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. The only assurance that, that he gave Moses in real time was his presence. Years later, or sometime later, months later, and he would, the second part of that promise he would, he would experience. No matter what happens, God is with me. And Paul just sort of thinks about all the calamities that are possible and identifies each of them individually and then says, no, really, if you just bundle the whole lot of them together, can that affect my life? At the end of Romans 8, he says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is an astounding statement. The presence of God can anchor me. Now, I want to finish with a warning. Isaiah 59.2, Isaiah tells, the, or God tells the people through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, your sins have separated you from me. The people were not uh, aware of God's presence, and there was a reason for that, is because they were headlong into their sin, and they felt justified in their sin. There was a separation there. And of course, all of us were at one time separated from God before we came to Christ. But it's possible for people to live their whole life and to be separated from God, even while they think God is close by. That was me for the first 20 years of my life. But just because I think so does not, does not mean that that's factual. The warning comes in Ephesians 2 and, first and 2 Thessalonians 1. Ephesians 2.12. Remember that in those days you were living utterly apart from Christ... You were enemies of God's children, 
and he had promised you no help. You were lost without God, without hope. And in 2 Thessalonians 1, the last two verses of the chapter, 9 and 10, he writes, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. St. Augustine uh, lived about 1,600 years ago or so. St. Augustine was one of the greatest Christian thinkers and philosophers in history. An amazing man. One day he was walking down the street and a uh, heathen man, an idolater, came up to him to rib him about his faith, uh, to heckle him. And he said, Augustine, I hold in my hand my idol, my God. I can see, I can show you my God. He said, Augustine, show me your God. Augustine nodded and he said, he said, I cannot show you my God. It's not because there is no God with which to show. It is because you have no eyes with which to see. To Augustine, the presence of God, the presence of God, was a fact. Whether anybody recognizes that is up to them. Father, we, uh, we can be easily distracted, fixated with other things that we think are people that what we need most. We can look to you to fix our lives, to look to you as a vending machine. Uh, at least we're looking in the right direction, um, but at the wrong outcome. Or, well, we as well-meaning Christians can fixate on the feelings of wanting to feel close to you and experience your presence. And there's certainly, of course, nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's delightful when that happens. But it seems like that you're after something deeper in us, and that is to be anchored in the fact of your presence. 